Well, good evening. Hey, Jim. Just want to say thanks to Jim and John, Mark, for having me uh, to be here to share with you. And I'm going to pray. Father, I want to confess before these men and before you, Lord, my need for you, our need for you. I pray, God, that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, that you would rid me of myself. So that I may be used by you and that you may be glorified. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Sean. I'm the pastor of Livingstone Calvary Chapel in Canyon City, um, where all the prisons are at. There's other things as well, but that's kind of maybe what we're, at least in, we've been known for. Um, my wife and I moved there in 1996 to help plant the church, and uh, reluctantly, as God was working on my heart and um, walking me in his will and not my own, um, I took over as senior pastor in 2005 and have been there ever since. So this, more, this evening, um, I have this topic of becoming a humble follower of God, and i um, our text is from uh, Micah, if you would like to open up your Bible and turn there. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. i got to reach back here and get some tissue. For those who can see my eyes, I apologize. I have had a double eye infection twice in two weeks. Actually... John, since I said yes, where's John Mark? He left. I blame him. <laughs> Ever since I said yes to the invitation of teaching, I have had the good fortune of having a kidney stone, a kidney infection, two sinus infections, and now um, two double eye infections. So um, it might have something to do with this topic of becoming a humble follower of God. I want to read to you the first eight verses of our text here. Um, listen carefully. It's, it's, it's a profound piece of Scripture. And it's the prophet Micah, and he's relaying um, God's word to the nation of Israel. They're in disobedience. It starts off in verse 1. It says, listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against His people, and He will bring a charge against Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you curse, and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. And now the people answer, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring Him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God Most High with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer Him thousands of rams and 10,000 10, rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? And now the prophet speaks. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what He requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. In Micah chapter 6, here we read, it's the last of three messages that God had for his people through the prophet Micah. And this message was a warning that challenged the Hebrew people who were walking in disobedience and living in spiritual adultery to turn away from their sinful ways, to trust 
in the Lord and to obey His will. And God promised that if they did these things, they would escape the judgments that were looming in their near future. So in verses 1-5, through God begins by calling His people to plead their case. And in doing so, He reminds them of how gracious He had been with them since their beginning. When He had delivered them from their Egyptian bondage, had given them leaders who guided them through the wilderness, and when He had ultimately brought them into the land of Canaan and gave it to them as an inheritance. And God did all of these things while putting up with their unbelief disobedience, and even their complaints against Him. And then when we reach verses 6 and 7 of the text that I already read, we read the people's reply, but instead of confessing their sins, they asked what they could do to get rid of their sins and said this, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring a burnt offering? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves should we offer him a thousand rams or ten thousand rivers of olive of olive oil should we here's the pinnacle right should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins and sadly it's these questions that they present to the lord that reveals how empty they were at this time in regards to their spiritual lives how ignorant they were in regards to how great their sins were and how ignorant they were of the cost to forgive them. In fact, if you see here, if you notice, their questions were nothing more than an attempt to bargain with God and and pay Him off as each question was a, a rising of their bid to get God to accept their deal. But as we know, God doesn't bargain with sinners. And none of the sacrifices they proposed could cleanse them of their sins. So the prophet Micah responds and told the people here exactly what the Lord required of them. And it's with these words that we see how it was a personal matter, as it is for each one of us. A personal matter that each person had to consider when he said this, No, O people, in verse 8, the Lord is The Lord has told you what is good. And this is what He requires of you. To do what is right. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we read these words of the prophet Micah and see the state of the nation of Israel and and look at what it means to be a humble follower of You, I pray, God, that You would birth and grow, continue to birth and grow humility in us. Lord, it's a a good thing to be Your man. And God, we're we're glad that You've called us and that we can say we're Your men and that You're our Father. We pray, God, that You would have Your way with us, that Your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, these verses are what brings us to this conference, to to the... First of the four basic traits of a man of God or of God's man. I like to say it like that. And this topic of becoming a humble follower of God. And, and I want to begin by saying that this is a unique thing, I think, for us to consider as, as we look at this, this becoming a, a humble follower of God because it implies, I think, on the surface that there's something that we can do to become humble or to become more humble humble than we currently are. And yet in all my reading of Scripture and study of Scripture, I can find no instance of any instruction that tells us what we can do to become humble. And yet the Word of God is full of instructions that command us to be humble, such as James chapter 4.10, which says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Also, the Word of God gives us many warnings about being humble, such as Proverbs 11, verse 2, which says, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with humble is wisdom. But with the humble is wisdom. Furthermore, the Word of God gives us many examples, instructions, warnings, and examples of men who were humble followers of God, like the prophet Isaiah, 
who began his service with those famous words recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, and said, Here I am. Send me. So listen, guys, as we consider the examples of men accounted in God's Word who said yes, who humbled themselves, men like Josiah, Hezekiah, Rehoboam, Ahab, Manasseh, David, and Joseph, as well as examples of men accounted in God's Word who, who said no, who did not humble themselves, men like Pharaoh, Amon, Zedekiah, and Belshazzar. What becomes clear is that humbling first belongs to the hand of God. In other words, God initiates the humbling of His creatures And once he has, the question confronts us. Will we receive it? Will we humble ourselves in response to his humbling hand? Or will we resist in our pride and kick against the humbling hand of God? You see, with this being said, I believe that we must understand that when we're talking about becoming a humble follower of God, Listen, there are no other types of men who truly follow after God. I say this because the only way to enter into a saving relationship, to enter into fellowship with God, to become a follower of God, is through the door of humility. The door that is opened by God's grace and entered by faith in the person and in the work of God's only begotten Son, Jesus of Nazareth. And even though, listen, listen, even though there may be no instructions in God's Word on how to become humble, the Word of God makes it clear that we are to be humble. As it tells us, hear this, to seek humility. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, to put on humility in Colossians 3, verse 12, to have a humble mind in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. To clothe ourselves with humility towards one another in 1 Peter 5, 5. Furthermore, Jesus promised that God will exalt the humble and calls us to pursue humility multiple times in the Gospels in Matthew 18, 4, Matthew 23, 12, Luke 14, 11, and, and Luke in Luke 18, 14. And listen, in light, of, in light of this, I believe that we should take a few minutes to gain a biblical understanding of what humility is. Now, in all honesty, I was a little bit surprised when I, when I realized that the first mention of humility in the Bible doesn't come until this the middle of this showdown between Pharaoh and God as mediated through Moses. That's the first time. And in in the book of Exodus chapter 5, we read, you're familiar with the story, right? We read of Moses first daring to appear before Pharaoh and he spoke on God's behalf saying, Yahweh says, let my people go. And then in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, we read of Pharaoh's prideful, we would say, response when he said, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And it's with these words that we see Pharaoh puffed up in his pride. We see that, that he, he's done this. He's miscalculated his status, has he not? He's miscalculated his status as creature in relation to God, the Creator. Because through Moses, God had spoke to Egypt's leader and called for him to obey. But Pharaoh refused. And then when we jump forward to Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, in this interaction and message from God, There's this interaction and this continued message from God, and it's described for us in this passage, Exodus 10, verse 3, the first time in all of God's Word as a call to humility. 
And by this time, seven of the ten plagues of God that were designed to reveal Yahweh to Pharaoh had passed. And the eighth plague of locusts was about to be released. And God spoke to Pharaoh and once again said to him, or at this time he said to him, listen, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? It's so important. It's so profound because this question asked in the context of this extended power encounter between Pharaoh and God gives us this glimpse into the heart of humility. For by it, we see that humility acknowledges and obeys the One who is truly Lord. Humility then is having a right view of self as created by and accountable to God. Let me say that again. Humility acknowledges and obeys the One who is truly the Lord. Humility is having a right view of self as created and accountable to God, which requires us then to have a right view of God as Creator, as authoritative in relation to His creatures. Therefore, humility is not being preoccupied with self and one's own lowliness, but as being mindful and conscious of God and, and His highness, His greatness, and then of self in respect to God. Andrew Murray, in his book titled Humility, The Journey Towards Holiness, he defines humility, he says, as the sense of entire nothingness. The sense of entire nothingness that comes when we see how truly God is everything and how truly we are nothing without Him. It's when we acknowledge the truth of our position as creature, he says, and yield to God His place as Creator. And with this definition, Andrew Murray continues and says this, humility is not so much a virtue along with others, but it is the root of all because it alone takes the right attitude before God and allows Him as God to do all. So humility. And, and dare I say that the act of becoming a humble man of God is initiated by God as He reveals Himself to us, and as we see God for who He is, and see ourselves in light of His everything, His power, His holiness, His majesty. Man, there, a great example of this is revealed in the life of the prophet Isaiah. When he was called by God to, to be his prophet, to be God's prophet, to be his man, to be God's man. And in this event, it's recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, where it says, Isaiah, he records it, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face with two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one cried to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and isaiah says and the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke and listen to isaiah's response he said so i said woe is me for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, 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 of people of unclean lips. For my, my eyes have seen, hear this, remember that statement, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so Isaiah saw, saw God sitting on His eternal throne where he revealed himself to Isaiah as the sovereign ruler over the entire universe, over everything. 
And having seen the all-powerful King of kings in his throne room, Isaiah says he saw and heard these great angelic creatures humbly worshiping God as they covered their face and their feet while continually crying out to declare the holiness and the glory of God. It was Charles Spurgeon who wrote about the seraphim in this context and said, even the sinless seraphim remembers that he is yet a creature. And therefore he conceals himself in a token of his nothingness and his unworthiness in the presence of the thrice holy God. And as God reveals his power and authority, and as the heaven's angels declare his holiness and glory, we see Isaiah responding, may I say rightly, correctly, by seeing himself for who and what he is in light of who and what God is. And as a result, this is the key, humility, envision this, is birthed in that moment, in that place. It's birthed inside of Isaiah. Guys, I'm here to tell you, I think the most profound example of humility being birthed is found in the book of Job. And when we come to the concluding chapters, we read God's response to Job's declaration of self-righteousness. And he answers Job's questions of why. Why had he allowed Job to suffer, by Job's estimation, unjustly, right? With so many hard and difficult things. And, And they were hard and difficult things. But Job is saying, why? Why, God? And beginning in in chapter 38, God speaks to Job. It says from a whirlwind. And in doing so, God revealed his eternal power by challenging Job to consider all that he had done, not only as creator, but as sustainer of everything that Job could see. He does so by asking Job many questions like this. Hear this. Imagine being questioned by God like this. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, Job's all, God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Why? What have I done to deserve this? God never answers these questions. He didn't explain it, but he says this, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Have you commanded the morning since the beginning of your days and caused the dawn to know its place? that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. And listen, there's two whole chapters of questions like this. And after these two chapters of questions like this, God finally says to Job in in chapter 40, verse 2, and he says this to Job, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Ooh. Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Job, you're contending with me. Should you correct me? He says, he who rebukes God, let him answer it. And as you can imagine, Job, if you will, being put in his place with a humbled heart, with a a, a changed heart, with a humbled change of heart, Job responds and he answers and in chapter 40, verses 3 through 8, and he says this, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Humility birthed. And then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you contend, would you condemn me that you may be justified? And with this 
an intense second round of questioning begins. It's not over. And the call to humility in the second round of questioning is what God is calling Job to when God concludes Job finally responds in humility to the mighty hand of God and says in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, he simply says, I know you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, hear what he says. I have uttered what I do not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have, I have heard of you, he says, by the hearing of the, of the ear. But like Isaiah, this is what he says, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself, Isaiah said, I am vile. Job says, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Humility was birthed. Guys, seeing and coming to know know who and what God is, coming and seeing to know who and what God is in light of who and what we are is where humility is birthed. But this is not a one and done event. It's something that God will do for us over and over and over again because He's gracious and merciful and loving. And He'll do this over and over and over again for us as He continues to reveal Himself to us and in doing so, making His power, His holiness, and His majesty known to us. But there is no other foundation There is no other foundation for humility to be birthed. And there is no other foundation for humility to be grown. Humility is birthed, but humility is also that is something that is grown. And yet it's from this foundation that we are elevated to becoming a humble follower of God. Now, according to what I read in Scripture, I see that these aren't the only two, but I think, this, I think these, are, these are the next building blocks, if you will. If, if it's God birthing humility in us and, and we respond to what He initiates by saying yes and recognizing ourselves for who and what we are in light of who and what He is, the next two building blocks, the, the two pieces of spiritual material by which God primarily will grow humility in us are these. And I think these things, these two things are exampled for us again in the lives of Isaiah and Job. And here they are. Their trials with its sufferings and worship with its praise. With the time I have left, I, I want to focus in on these things. On becoming a humble follower of God. Trials with its sufferings and worship with its praise. And with that being said, we should understand that it's one thing to see and know who and what God is and be moved to repent and to live in humble obedience. That's one thing where humility is birthed. However, it's another thing to move into the place of dependency upon God. And, and trials with its sufferings are often the means by which God will work in this journey of humility, right? Creating dependency. As He opens our hearts and He opens our minds to see our need for Him in the day-to-day happenings of our lives. There's a little book called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's a it's an, it's a it's a it's a it's a gathering of writings and testimonies about this Parisian monk, Brother Lawrence, a 16th century Parisian monk. And in this book, The Practice of the Presence of God, Brother Lawrence is quoted as saying this, God humbles us through suffering and pain, inside and outside. Pain on the inside and pain on the outside. He says, therefore, it should not surprise us that 
People cause us troubles, temptations, oppositions, and difficulties. And then he says this, we should accept these and bear them for as long as God wishes and view them as highly beneficial to our spiritual development. In that same book, Brother Lawrence, when giving counsel to a sick friend, said this, I do not pray that you may be delivered from your pains, but I pray earnestly that God would give you strength and patience to bear them as long as he pleases. I wish you could convince yourself that God is often, in some sense, nearer to us and more effectually present with us in sickness than in health. He often sends disease of the body to cure those diseases of the soul. I have often, he said, been near expiring, but I have never so much as been satisfied as then. Accordingly, I did not pray for any relief, but I prayed for strength to suffer with courage, humility, and love. Ah, how sweet it is to suffer with God. Brother, uh, practice, the practice of the presence of God. Guys, we know it was the Apostle Paul, right, who wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7-9, through 9, of how trials with its sufferings play a role of promoting humility in his life. Paul writes, and he said, he says, he says to keep me from becoming conceited, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power might rest on me. So as I see it, there are four primary reasons to give us some practical application here for why trials and sufferings grow us, grow, or, or how, they, how they grow humility in us. For why trials and sufferings grow humility in us. Number one, trials and sufferings grow humility in us because they bring dependence on God. Number one, that's the beginning point. And, and this is the conclusion of the, the, the Apostle Paul. This conclusion he comes to when he explains that in his weakness, Christ's power is made perfect. And, 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 and I think we all know this, but when we're at the end of our rope, right, when we're out of all options and out of every strength is when we're fully dependent upon Jesus and the all-sufficiency of God's grace in our life. His unmerited and earned, earned love for us. My grace is sufficient. My favor for you is sufficient. My love for you is enough. And this is why Paul would then confidently say in, in the face of his sufferings, he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Number two, trials and sufferings or trials with sufferings grow humility in our lives because they cause us to long for God and for our heavenly home. I've never been as sick as I have in the last three months. I'm typically a healthy person. But I tell you what, I'm looking forward to a glorified body when this one no longer has these kind of problems. <laughs> Trials and sufferings grow humility in us because they cause us to long for God and for our heavenly home. And the fact of the matter is, is that we can, we can quickly and easily get caught up with the world. We do. We can. And yet, when life becomes painful, do we not long for heaven? When life becomes confusing, do we not long for the peace that is going to be found in the presence of God? And do we not long for the very one who is heaven, who has redeemed us and loves us? 
Guys, many of the psalmists cry out with these same thoughts to God when in trouble. I was going to read a few passages from this psalm, but I want to read the whole psalm to you. It's a good example. It's Psalm 42. It's a little long, but I think it's appropriate for where we're at this evening. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When... Shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been food day and night while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I refuse to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept the pilgrim's feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for yet I shall praise Him for the help of His countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I will remember You. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I will remember You from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill of Mizor. Deep calls into deep at the noise of Your waterfalls and all of Your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command His loving kindness in daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemies? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, the psalmist says, for yet I shall praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. You see, in light of this psalm, I believe it's obvious that the psalmist is going through difficulty. But that difficulty is what's driving him to God. Likewise, for us who believe in God and a heavenly home, when trials and sufferings come, the response is to long for God. Number three, trials and sufferings, uh, or trials with sufferings, grow humility in our lives because they, they cause us to, let's say, examine ourselves and seek to eliminate sin. Psalm 19, 119, verse 67. Psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And perhaps one of the greatest things about trials and sufferings is that they purge sin from within us. As the trial and suffering is often the, the, the refining fire that God will use to purify us. And this is what we read of in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6-7, through 7, which says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, and oh, it needs to be, that you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, the trial, that it may be found to praise and honor and glory with the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so men, as Christians, as, 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 as men today who go through trials, we should take the opportunity to examine ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit like the psalmist in 139 who spoke to God and said, Search me, O God, and, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. Number four. Trials and sufferings grow humility in our lives because they cause us to learn from the Word of God things that we could not and probably would not learn otherwise. Psalm 119, verse 71 says it like this. The psalmist writes, he says, It was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. I have to admit that there's, there's, there's a strange beauty to trials and sufferings. In, 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 in that, they simplify life. They strip away day-to-day distractions. 
They show us what truly is important because when trials and sufferings are present, our minds more often than not become clear and tuned into the lessons that God would have for us. Charles Spurgeon, speaking about these same thoughts, said this, Most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. Most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with hot irons of affliction. Otherwise, we shall not truly receive them. He goes on and he says, Read a truth in tranquility. Read it in peace. Read it in prosperity. And you will not make anything of it. But be inside the furnace. And you will be able to spell all the hard words and understand more than you could without it. So, God grows humility in us through trials and sufferings to become humble followers of Him. And the second building block, spiritual building block, is that God will also grow humility in us through worship. And the worship of God grows humility because at the root of all worship is us assuming our position as creature and yielding to God as place as creator. All worship. It's the sense of entire nothingness that come when we recognize that God is everything. And this is the place that both Isaiah and Job were moved to that we've read about as a result of their encounters, as a result of seeing God. Furthermore, the worship of God grows humility because the worship of God is a submission of self and our flesh. Hear this as you know this. Our flesh is the first thing that needs to be taken out of the way. Living sacrifices, putting ourselves upon the altar. Also, the worship of God grows humility because the worship of God requires us to lift our voices in praise to Him. In praise, praise is a shift of, of focus. It's a shift of focus from self to God as we recognize God's goodness, His majesty, His holiness, His might. His mercy, and then we proclaim it out loud. And it's when we've tasted and when we've seen God's goodness that, that we're moved to open our mouths and to praise God. Lastly, the worship of God grows humility because the worship of God is responsive. Meaning worship is, hear this, this is so important. The worship of God is not conditional. Do you know that? The worship of God is not conditional to how we feel or on what good or bad things that we might be going through. Because God is always worthy of our worship. So becoming a humble follower of God is something that God initiates in us. As humility is birthed when God reveals Himself to us and we see God for who He is and see ourselves in light of His everything, His power, His holiness, and His majesty. And becoming, becoming a humble follower of God is a continued work of God. As God grows humility in us with the spiritual building blocks of trials with sufferings and with the worship of the King of kings and the Lord of lords who created us and, and so graciously loves us. But the question that we open with must still be answered. Will we resist in our pride and resist these works of God? Or, we will humble, or, will, we hum, or will we humble ourselves in response to His humbling hand and enter into the works of God and become men who are humble followers of God. And I pray, God, that we would say yes. That as your men, we would say yes to the continuing work that you have promised 
to do in us. Father, you said that you started this good work. You're the author of it. You also tell us that you're the finisher of it. That you'll bring it to a completion. And so once again, Father, as we set on this journey of of being your men and what that looks like, these traits, these attributes of being a godly man, of being God's man, your man, I pray, Father, that you would do this work in us and we would continue to say yes. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.